Thank you for attending the uh, Reading Zoning Board of Appeals this evening. We have a number of uh, issues on our plate. Um, we have some new people sitting at the table, so I'm going to ask to go around the table and introduce yourselves. Uh, Mark, why don't we start with you? Mark Dupel, Building Commissioner. Mm. Kyle Torto. Nick Pernice. Uh, Robert Redfern. John Jarrero. John Coet. Chris Heap from Town Council's office. Andrew Gentekel, staff planning. Okay. Um, we have uh, three items on our agenda this evening. The first item uh, is from uh, Metropolitan at Reading Station, uh, the Reading, Vi quote, Reading Village, which is on a 40B that was issued basically a year ago this coming February. Um, this is not a hearing, per se, uh, because it's other business. In other business, you're only allowed to discuss a particular issue that's before the board. And um, there is a protocol that we use when dealing with all of our hearings. This, even though it is not a hearing, will be conducted as if it were a hearing. And I'll go over that in a second. Um, well, I might as well do it right now. Um, the protocol is that uh, we open the hearing or we open the issue before us with a reading of what was been posted in the newspapers, uh, which is the official uh, record. Uh, we then uh, have the applicant um, who's asking for relief uh, present uh, their particular situation or their case. We then go to the board uh, for questions um, or uh, concerns that they may have. We then also talk to uh, any individuals that we have called upon to present, and we always ask Andrew to type in, being our staff planner. Uh, and now that we have Mark as our new building commissioner, uh, full-time building commissioner, we may ask him to his input into these also. Uh, at that point, um, we will open the public section of the hearing. Uh, we will take information from people. If you have not signed in, please, in the back, we need a record. Uh, once we start opening the hearing, I will ask all people who wish to speak to step, uh, stand up and take an oath. And from that point forward, when you're recognized, you'll be given a certain amount of time. And I'll talk about this one specifically when we get to this particular case. Um, you have a specific amount of time. You need to stand up, give us your name and your address. State your concern. And um, I may or may not overrule you. It depends upon what your issue is for this evening. Now I'll go specifically to this one because it is, as I said, it's actually not a hearing. It's a request for a modification of a decision that was made uh, almost a year, 11 months, a little less than 11 months ago, a little more than 11 months ago. Um, and I'll start off by indicating that this is a uh, request from the uh, uh, Metropolitan at Reading Station, Reading uh, Village, 40B, as for the determination of a substantial or in insubstantial or not substantial change to the project at 3141 Lincoln Street and 2 through 12 Prescott Street. Assessors map 16, lots 224, 225, and 226. And along with that, um, I will only ask those individuals, there is a, a, a specific process that we follow, but because this is not a hearing, I'm not going to go through that, except to say, that anybody who thinks they may wish to speak to me tonight needs to stand up and raise their right hand. Fix up counsel. So if you think you may want to speak to tonight, please stand up and raise your right hand. By the way, it does not hurt at all. You're not obligated. We're not taking pictures. Um, Testimony given before this board is taken under oath, so if you may wish to speak, please stand and raise your right hand. I swear that the testimony given by me before this board this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and the answer is I do. I do. Thank you. 
Now, let me get to this particular case or this particular situation. We're asking for a question of whether this change, this modification, which I'm going to ask the applicant to come up and talk about in a second, but I want to frame it first um, by saying that in 40B, there is a section for permit modifications, comprehensive permit modifications. Under Chapter 760 CMR 56.05, uh, parentheses 11, the ZBA has 20 days to determine and notify the develop developer applicant whether request of change is substantial. Uh, if it is, if it is, Request whether it is substantial or insubstantial. If it is insubstantial, the change is deemed approved. If it's considered to be substantial, um, change follows the same basic timelines as our original permit process. That means the public hearing must be held within 30 days of the ZBA's determination, which we've done this evening. And the ZBA must file its decision with the city or town clerk with 40 days of hearing, within the hearing with the decision. Now I go to 40B, and 40B is very specific. Uh, under the same section, 760 CMR 56.07 dash parentheses 4C, the following will generally be substantial changes. One, an increase of more than 10% in the height of the building, of buildings, an increase of more than 10% in the number of housing units proposed, Three, a reduction or three reduction in the size of the site of more than 10% in excess of any decrease in the number of housing units proposed. Four, the change in the building type, garden apartments versus townhouses versus high rises. Or the last one, a change from one form of the housing tenure to another. Pursuant to 760 CMR 556-07D, the following will generally be substantial changes. Those were insubstantial changes. These are substantial changes. And this is according to 40B, which is mass housing, which oversees this whole process. Okay, these are, D, D, D is not substantial. Pardon me? D, D is the ones that are not considered substantial. Oh, I'm sorry, which are not considered to be substantial. Okay. One, a reduction in the number of housing units proposed. A decrease of less than 10% in the floor area of the individual units. A change in the number of bedrooms within the individual units. If such changes do not alter the overall bedroom count of the proposed housing of more than 10%. A change in the color or style of materials used. And the last one, a change in the financial program under which the applicant plans to receive a subsidy, subsidy if, the change affects, if the change affects no other aspect of the proposal. Those are the two categories that the board has to work with this evening. During this process, as I said, the first thing that we will do is open it for the applicant to categorize or summarize exactly what he was wishing to do. The board then will talk or speak or question the applicant. If, uh, and I'm going to ask Chris to do an overlay for me, just our town, town attorney, and possibly Andrew if he has any information, and or Mark. So the first thing I'm going to ask is, uh, Chris, could you summarize exactly where we're at tonight on this specific request? Sure. Um, I think you just did it um, very well. I think you just laid a timetable for making a decision. Uh, but just to sort of re-summarize, the applicant has applied for a amendment to their comprehensive permit. Your, the ZBA's first task when that kind of request comes in is to make a determination as to whether or not the requested change is substantial or insubstantial. You, you must make that determination and notify the applicant of your determination within 20 days of receipt of the um, request. So you're currently within that 
window of time, but there's not no much. That's time a, left. that's a, in, in in the land use permitting world. That's a very short window of time, uh, but the regulations require you to make that decision within 20 days. As you said, if the board determines the change requested change or changes to be insubstantial, then they are deemed approved from that point forward without any for, without any written modification to the decision or any further action from the board. Uh, a determination that the change is insubstantial is all the applicant needs to move forward. Um, if, however, the ZBA determines that the change is substantial, uh, then the board needs to open a public hearing on the requested change within 30 days of that determination. So if you were to vote that tonight, you'll then have 30 more days to open up a public hearing to, to consider the, the merits of the request uh, on, a, on, a, on a larger basis. Um, as you laid out the criteria for, well, a, a non-comprehensive list of criteria that are contained in DHCD's regulations, there are five things that are necessarily considered substantial, and there are five things that are considered insubstantial. Sadly, um, a change to setbacks doesn't appear on anywhere on that list. So those those ten examples are helpful only by way of an analogy. Um, you know, the, the, the regulations don't tell you what the hard and fast benchmark is if they need to change their setbacks. Um, so so you need to apply those as best you can, even though they don't line up exactly. Um, the only so those are the criteria. That's the timing. Uh, the only other two things I'd add are. I want first that the board's review of this project at this point is limited specifically to the changes presented by the applicant. This by evening. In, in, their appli in their letter to you dated mm -hmm. January 7th. By coming in for a modification, the applicant does not reopen the whole, pro the whole project or other aspects of the project. It is only, you may only look at um, the specific change that they've requested. Uh, the own, and the second thing I'd add is that any determination that the board makes um, in terms of substantial or insubstantial or approving or denying the requested changes down the road at a public hearing are appealable by the uh, applicant to the Housing Appeals Committee. So it's, as with all things 40B, it's important to keep in mind who, uh, who will ultimately be reviewing a determination of this board should the applicant file an appeal. And in this case, that would be the Housing Appeals Committee. Uh, any, think. any questions or, from the board? Or, yeah, or just to add to that, Chris, or anybody a, a appeals, whether it's the developer or mm -hmm. an abutter, sure. or it's if, only the developer that can appeal. If it's if you are, if the change is found to be insubstantial, right, uh, it is not. The, the applicant would presumably go away happy. Right. And it is not entirely clear to me that a, a neighbor or a butter would have an appeal of that determination. Uh -huh. if, uh, they may, but that's that, that's an interesting question. If you find this request to change to be substantial and needing a public hearing in 30 days, then your decision after that, after at the close of that public hearing, could be appealed by the applicant to the Housing Appeals Committee or by a neighbor or an abutter to Superior Court or to Land Court. So there's a couple different ways that could go. Tonight, any questions? No comments. No comments. No comments. Um, I would just like to ask a question too. Sure. The question that I have is ultimately this board in making a termination tonight. Um, there was there was a let me put it this way. There was a contract signed on the 23rd of February 2018. 17. 17. 17. And the contract is in the decision. And it's all of that is brought up in the decision. The applicant through mass housing, which does the 40B for affordable housing, has specific standards. You have to go through the whole process with mass housing and we have a number of 40 B's that we've gone through this. In the end, only one of two things is going to happen in my mind, correct me if I'm wrong. One, we're going to go forward and this project is going to be built one way or the other. 
or this, this project will not be built. If it's not built, it's because the applicant has withdrawn, gone to mass housing, and one of two things can happen. Mass housing can say, okay, uh, we will allow you to take the modifications and go your own way, and from now on you come back to us, mass housing. We'll make the determination. Or number two, you can walk away from it, and, but I'm sure you're going to lose a substantial amount of money or whatever, so I don't think that that's going to happen. But one way or the other, this project is going to be completed, I believe, in my mind, because we've never had a 40B that was never completed. And I don't think there's too many 40Bs in the state that went belly up and were not completed. So one way or another, this is what we're dealing with. Now I'm going to ask the applicant to to go over his request. And I have to tell you, board members, as well as people from the community on the public section of the hearing, which I'll open up after that, after the board gets through. And that is, you are restrained from only talking about this particular letter, which designate changes in the setback requirements that they're requesting. Nothing else can be discussed because that's not what's being on the plate this evening. This board is restricted to only discuss and make a ruling on what is presented to it in the rendering that appears in the newspaper, or in this case, uh, request for modification as additional um, requests to the board. So, uh, Matt, I will turn it over to you and you can start yes. telling us exactly what it Thank is. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Happy to turn not so. And members of the board that I've met, some that are new. Um, it's been a while, but just as I, as I said in the letter real quick, an update, the building's pretty much weather tight and framed. Um, so that's good when they're going in, all that stuff. So what happened was uh, when we filed for a building permit last year, the permit that was issued is what we actually built. The as-built matches the permit that was issued. Now, you know, that, there may be a discrepancy of a half inch somewhere or something. I, 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 I certainly would have to look. The changes, and I didn't pick it up then, and, and my fault, but those plans, um, that's what was presented. There was no high anything. Everyone, every board, every department in town had those plans, and that's what the building permit was issued. And that's what the as-built reflects. What happened was when we went through the construction drawing phase, uh, there was some minor tweaks to the um, building location and, and a few other things. So I'll just walk you through what those are. Um, on the Prescott Street side right there, I don't have a pointer, but um, at the end of the building here, right here, during code review, we had to put a, uh, a, a, a egress path there for people walking out the back of the building. Um, and that had to be a certain distance per fire code um, and building code. So when we, we put that path in, and that's on the approved plan, the building had to shift slightly away from the neighbor there um, and a little bit towards, towards the corner of Prescott and Lincoln. And the way the building's angled isn't the same exact angle as the corner of Lincoln and Prescott. So as anytime you shift something a little bit, it's going to throw off all your setbacks everywhere else. So part of the um, setback change uh, there on the Lincoln Street side is because we pushed the building down a little bit. Um, some of the other changes were structural in nature to achieve the parking requirement that we had to. Some of these columns here are slightly different. They may be an inch off than what was actually shown there when you actually engineer it with the structural engineer, which wasn't done during this phase. So when you do that, the buildings slightly change somewhat. Um, so the shift in the building changed somewhat. Our hallways actually got a few inches wider. Um, one of the recommendations we heard during the whole project is we have long hallways, and you should try to do things to make those more appealable to people in the building. Um, all minor changes in the whole scheme of things. What we also have added, and as part of our request per the building department, is um, on Prescott Street, there's uh, four balconies. They're shown on our, the architecturals for the approval plans. They're shown on architecturals for the construction drawing plans, but they actually weren't shown as a setback on the civil plan. So while they were on the plans, they weren't on the civil plan because they're above grade, there's no supports or anything, they're, they're cantilevered. So we added that dimension to the plan. That's one of the reasons why it seems even a little closer on the Prescott Street side. Um, and on, on the Lincoln Street side, it's hard to see, but there's actually a slight jog in the building right here. 
and that was never, so the setback here, which was six feet, didn't pick up on that jog. So when we added that jog, which was also on the approved plans, on the construction drawing plans, and when we added that jog, there was a, that we added that to the as-built plan as well. So what the result is, is there's a little less area that we have pavers in front of the building and it's the landscaping, but the landscaping actually is mostly on the town property, as is the walkways that we're putting in. So in essence, it's just a little less pavers. The building's the same, 68 units, the same parking ratio. It's probably a little bit different in, in some spots, but that's you know a foot or less um, based on some of the structural. So as we went through the process two years ago, you know, th those aren't construction drawings. So anytime you do the construction drawings and some of these details, things slightly change. So we uh, once we realized it, we, I, 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 my mistake, I should have, I didn't realize it when we actually did the building permit plans, but what we built was the building permit plan. So it wasn't, we didn't build something that the town didn't see, it's that we didn't pick up on the discrepancy when we filed for the building permit last year. And had I picked it up, I would have come in at that point and asked for a uh, insubstantial change to the plans. So I think that is a pretty quick summary of kind of where we're at, where we are. Uh, I think you did a pretty thorough job. We're going to go into 40B and substantial into the thorough job on that. So if you have any questions, happy. Like you said, we're here for this specific issue. So um, certainly happy to answer the questions. I would ask uh, Andrew first. Uh, I know that a year ago, that was just as you were coming in the door. Um, so I would ask if uh, what Matt has presented seems to be factual. I do agree. Um, the building permit plans, as I know, were, as he said, um, approved and built as they were submitted. And we had just now noticed that some of the balconies didn't have the setback, so we had asked for those changes to be implemented onto the plans, which is why we are here tonight. Um, we did ask for the as built for quite some time. It took a little longer to get to us than anticipated, but that's as to be expected. So. <laughs> I forgot one thing. On that. Thank you for bringing that up. So in, in the interim, also, our the firm that does our civil plans, they change surveyors. And I know it sounds crazy, but every time a new surveyor comes in, they have to resurvey the properties. So because there's so many properties and deeds around there, um, there was actually some minor, minor discrepancies on when he resurveyed it. And we actually gave ourselves a few inches less land in some areas, an inch or two, just so that there wasn't any issue. I know it probably doesn't seem plausible well, how did two surveyors come up with it? But because you're dealing with, I think it was like 18 deeds, a lot of those plans overlap. So that was part of the reason why it took longer to get the as built because they actually had to go out and resurvey our whole property. And that also changes some discrepancies in inch or two here and there. Um, I'm not, Mark wasn't even around at that time, so I'm not going to ask for his input at this point. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but we may come back to you later. Uh, so I'll, I'll go around the table side. Any questions uh, that you might have? Well, I was the board member a year ago who did not vote for this project. The only one. Uh, and as I drove by it this week, several times, it has become a very, very huge facility. Uh, perhaps bigger than most of us had envisioned at the time we were reviewing it and listening, looking at dimensions and so forth. Uh, but what, what, what this is here, I don't see as being anything out of the ordinary when you come to building a structure like this and finding out that it's not exactly dimension <laughs> and uh, considering the the size of that facility uh, when we start talking about two or three feet uh, I really don't consider that a significant change in the structure I'll leave it at that okay Robert uh, as you say we'll limit our uh, talks to just what's being requested tonight uh, looking at this, uh, Mark, uh, 
The decision allowed you on Prescott Street 6.9 feet offset is what uh, Prescott Street uh, was noted in the uh, papers. Uh, and now you're asking for 5.8 feet, which is a change of 1.1 feet, uh, divided by the original 6.9 feet. That's a reduction of 15.9%. Seems quite significant to me. Lincoln Street's even worse. Uh, you have, uh, with the decision, uh, for the project called for a uh, 5.8 foot offset. <coughs> now you're requesting on Prescott Street 3.3 feet. That's a change of two and a half feet divided by the original 5.8 feet. That's a change of 43%. Quite significant if you ask me. I consider both of these to be substantial changes my way of thinking based on percentages okay uh, granted you're dealing with small offsets to start with but that is the way 40b works is uh, that can be bypassed uh, by the uh, developer on the uh, 40b process he does not have to go by the town zoning bylaws but this decision was, to me, made in good faith by the town. And now you're asking for changes that I, I think, personally, are, are pretty substantial. That's okay. Yeah. Nick? Um, so I actually tend to agree with both uh, the previous board members. Um, however, though, given that the percentage decrease is more than, you know, DHCD's 10% guide, but for other categories, I also look at the, the town land as a buffer between, you know, protecting the public good and making sure there's enough egress in public way. So I am actually leaning towards, more towards, this is in the larger grand scheme of things and not, in my opinion, substantial. Yes. Uh, so I was just <clears throat> looking at the satellite view of the existing conditions in the neighboring area. I'm also the opinion that there's a benefit actually in having stepped away on the eastern side or western side of the building from the adjacent property. Um, that is probably a little bit of an improvement to the neighboring lot there. And that particularly on Lincoln Street, given that that is facing and addressing the very large public way of the railroad station, um, I see that that <clears throat> is not of a major impact versus Maybe somewhat along Prescott Street, where you have some adjacent properties across the street, there is some consideration of that encroachment. But I think that overall, I'm in the agreement that this is a minor impact to the change of the existing building uh, to where it was proposed versus where it is at this point in time. Okay. Um, I'm the last guy. Um, 40Bs um, are comprehensive permits. That means everybody comes together and tells the board what they believe is appropriate and not appropriate, what can and can't be done within the parameters of our bylaws, current bylaws. Um, the whole process used to take, uh, the state used to give us uh, 360 days to do this. Um, as of two years ago, and maybe it was three years ago, I think it was two years ago, they decided they're going to cut that in half, so now it's only a six month. There is no way with a project this substantial or some of the other 40Bs that we're working with that you're going to get it done in, in uh, half the time. You always have to ask for extensions. Now the biggest thing is that a 40B is a conceptual design. It doesn't want to know exactly how many feet or how many inches something is going to take or be moved. Um, you have to come up with a plan in mind, but on paper, it really doesn't become critical in ink until you get to the, um, oh, what do they, what, what, what do we miss? Um, Foundation. No, well, we do. We normally do a foundation plan, 
and that goes forward and is checked off against the plans, the engineering plans that were put on the property. Somehow, this got missed along the line. Or we didn't, we didn't get an accurate picture of that. But in reality, when you have another department indicating that somewhere along the line in the whole process that uh, we missed the safety aspects of the pathway around the building, that had to be in there by fire standards. So you have to accommodate for some of these things. All of the 40 Bs come in with minor adjustments, modifications, whatever. This would appear to be major, but in my mind, uh, I would agree with uh, two of the other board members, um, or actually possibly three of the other board members, that uh, this is not uh, substantial in my mind because it's going to, number one, there's going to be, there's already something in the air. How do you modify that? You have to modify it by standards, which we still have, oper not, not the board, staff has to operate from. Um, and there's, you cannot <coughs> visualize all of the options on the set of plans that were the documents that were presented. The final set of documents, which was the, when the building permit was issued, um, I don't know if that is, is up front or not. I don't know that. I mean, we didn't go out and survey it. I mean, per se, the board didn't. I don't think that the staff doesn't. Um, so we have to take, to some degree, unless it's a major problem, we have to take their word for it. And, but I'm sure that uh, Mark will probably be looking at that uh, down the line too, to just to justify some of that stuff. The point from, from my standpoint of view is that um, the percentage look large, but the actual impact <coughs> for the safety and well-being of the people in the community and in the neighborhood do not seem to be impaired, especially when the fire department comes up and says that you must accommodate us this. You must give us this additional space. And I'll have to tell you also, too, this board, in my experience, for the time I've spent on it, which is a long time, I've been through many 40Bs. Um, Um, the balconies or whatever you want to call them um, it's been going back and forth and back and forth is that part of the setback requirement change not here but it seems to change in the courts with the state and at present um, it has been for a number of years now balconies are included so when you look at the balcony, it's not the building, it's the balcony that's extending out. And that's part of the decision. You must accommodate for the balcony in your setback requirements. And I, the only question that I have of uh, Matt is, how much of that is uh, basically the foot and, uh, foot, would you say it was foot and uh, three inches? Uh, which part here? The uh the balcony yeah. uh, was requested, uh, let's see, uh, would be 3.2 feet. And the original offset uh, that was allowed by the decision was 6.9 feet. So if you went by the balcony, you're talking over 50% uh, no, no, reduction. No, no the, the point I was asking is the balcony is considered in the separate right. requirements. So even though the balcony the balcony is pushing the setback requirement to a smaller dimension. If the balconies weren't there and we weren't and we weren't counting them, it would be, it would be basically almost back to where it was before. Well, you, you'd be foot and a half, 1.1 feet less. I didn't come, when I first talked about this, I did not include the balconies. Okay. I said to the face of the building, face of the building. I wasn't okay. even looking at the balconies. Okay. Matt, if you want to? No, no, that's good. It's 1.1 1, 1 feet for those. Yeah. Reasons. The balconies were added 
at, at the request right. of the building department. And so now if you consider the balconies. So the balconies also, we're on all the architecture, right. but those have to be a certain dimension per code too, um, mm -hmm. to be an actual ba balcony. Um, so uh, you know, there, there was, as I said, they've been on every plan. There was no hiding it. You could look at the building permit plans with the and the dimensions on there. And that's what we built to. The mistake was we didn't pick that up then, and it was it made it through the building permit process then, and that's what we built to. So, okay. Yeah. Um, last person I'm going to go to is uh, Chris. I know uh, this is not <laughs> <laughs> to ask you. I'm asking for the ramifications of all of this now. No, I think all of your comments are. are um, well put. I mean, and you've you've heard the criteria, and I think you've 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 applied them. I mean, I think I don't have much to add. I guess the only other thing I'd add is um, a lot of the I guess is maybe a question for Matt. A lot of the sidewalks shown on the plans as part of the comprehensive permit exist within the town's right of way. Are all the dimensions of the sidewalks remain Correct. the same? Yeah. So all we haven't. So it, is it? Hasn't changed. So it's fair to say then that. The, the movement of the face of the building closer to this to the lot lines has not affected the dimensions of the setbacks of the sidewalks as shown on the plans approved as part of the comprehensive and, and it hasn't changed the location of the sidewalks either. that's all that's the only other thing i'd add that's okay do we have any other questions before the app the applicant at this time i'm, I'm going to open it up to public uh, comment i'm asking you to keep your concerns to what has been presented here this evening um, this is not something that we need to do or have to do but i think because of the concerns that we have had um, we'll listen to the concerns that you have relative to this issue and this issue only so the public section of the uh so hearing the, the discussion is now open. Please raise your hand if you wish to make a comment. And again, please identify yourself, name and address. So we have it for the record. Yes. Mary Ellen on 125 Summer Avenue. Um, I would just like to state that I, I agree with what Bob said about this, what was done with the ZBA was the public process and the good faith agreement. And the community doesn't have general access to building permit plans. They have no input in that. So the developer knew they were at, on a tight spot and they pushed it as far as they could. You, grant, you granted them lots of variances. And so I think that it's not an either or. It's not build it or not build it. It's built, it's going to be there. But I don't think you should set the bar so low going forward with all these other projects in the pipeline. And I would recommend a fine. Because I think there should be some more, there should have been more um, openness and transparency with the um, committee and with the community with regard to this. Okay, thank you. In the back of the room. Everett Blight at 99 Prescott Street. My general concern is this was brought up initially uh, that the walkability of Prescott Street is tight there, it's crowded, and initially that building was even closer to the sidewalk. And we express concern, they push it back to about the six foot level. And I was still concerned about it. And now you've got it, the balcony is extending out. Um, I think this is very close to danger for people walking by, especially in the winter months when there's snow on the roof. The present roof down there, though it was there originally, by the way, the building was not closed in, maybe 60% closed in. Uh, the roof raft is not even on, but the uh, Lincoln Street side. Um, that there's a great, there's no distance in there for snow blowing off in a four-story. I know it's one on three on top of one, but somebody's going to get clocked. Uh, balconies and the railings on them. Somebody said something on it. It's going to come off. This is very tight, and I think it's a real safety problem. Um, that we're looking at. Um, I don't know how you remedy it, remedy it, but uh, correct it. But, uh, Basically, that's tight for walking down there. The old building was too tight. We should have known that we could have left this in that close to the street. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes. John Myers, 30 by Van Gogh Street. This, this is compliance to a permit. 
This is an after the fact, I'm coming to you for forgiveness because I've already made these changes and I don't care what you said originally. It's disgusting and it's very disrespectful to your board. Um, at least this should be post, let the community come in and have an open hearing about it. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Mary Hack, 42 Riverside Drive. I do agree with some of the comments that were made. I think that as a board, you're representing us. I think the builder and the developer have taken advantage of the people of Reading. I've heard all around that we're not developer friendly and builder friendly. Well, it is here. It's here to stay. It's not going to go anywhere. But I think that to set a precedent to let a builder of any 40B project think that they can come in and make a change without addressing it before fact with you is just taking advantage of the community. And I think that you making a decision saying that it's insubstantial is also taking advantage of the community. I mean, I tried to contact the Inspector General's office today just to find out, as a resident, what our, what we can do. Um, I feel bad for some of the abutters. Um, and yeah, it's going to probably be gorgeous when it's done, but I think it's taking advantage of the community. I think that they knew that they could do this based on being 40B and had no respect for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Matt, did you want to address yeah, something? Yeah, I, 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 I get it, but we uh, we gave these plans to the town. It was no disrespect. It was all on the plans. We went through a lengthy process with permit review that we paid for with the town. And, um, you know, like you said, those plans originally are schematic. I've sat on boards. I was chair of a board. I've seen lots of 40B minor modifications come through. And that's why they try to give a guideline of what would really lies the level. I mean, you could add some units, and that alone isn't declared a substantial change on its own. So the idea here was some of the, the things change, some of the things change an inch. When you start moving buildings on a site like this, six inches, it throw it can throw off dimensions everywhere on the building. Uh, we have plans in place for snow removal and all that, so, so I get that. It's our responsibility. But the sidewalks are where they were, and, um, you know, it, it, we're, we're again here on an issue that it wasn't like we changed it. It was, went through a lengthy process. It just fell through and wasn't picked up then. Okay. Thank you for the reply. Yes. Um, Christine Moss, 52 Washington Street. I would argue that this is substantial, and my reason for that is not necessarily even the size of the change, but this is something that was discussed ad nauseum during the open meeting um, process about the setback and we specifically brought up the overhang and I'm sorry that they weren't in the permits but I think it's embarrassing as a developer not to realize that his overhang those balconies are going to overhang so I feel like that omission was a very deliberate omission and I can't understand how a developer doesn't realize yeah we're talking here for an hour at a meeting about the setback and about the ice and the residents are saying, well, we're really concerned about ice falling down and saying, like, oops, they didn't notice that there are balconies that are overhanging. If this was a foot in the back or even the job path, that wasn't something that was discussed. So you could say, yeah, it's not a significant square footage of change. But if you look at, go back to when the whole planning process was, the amount of time that we spent discussing the setbacks, this was a big issue. So if you take how big this issue was during the planning process and realize that they violated it, I think it magnifies the significance. Thank you. Matt, do you have a uh, snow removal and snow plan that has been uh, addressed with uh, staff? Do you want mm -hmm. to talk about that a little bit? But we do, and, and clearly now it's different during construction um, than during uh, when you're operational. Uh, and again, when we're actually operational, we have to submit a new operational plan, but any snow on site has to be removed from site. Um, so, and we are also responsible, what we're doing now, um, we haven't had snow really this year, but, and again, we'll see how it goes, because we're not perfect, but we got a clear, clear um, Prescott that, that's in the crosswalk there. Um, so, you know, we're as good as the guys doing it, so we have, we'll see when it snows, but, um, you know, there's a plan to clear the snow in front of the building. That's a pick, kind of a paver and a little landscaped area, very minimal, because it was never a big, 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 big to begin with. So, uh, but there is both a construction plan and an operational plan once you're at least you know, easy. 
Okay, that was a quick diversion because I heard three comments on it, but we need to stay on task. Uh, anybody else in the community wish to speak? Yes, Vanessa. Vanessa Alvarado, Grand Street. Um, bear with me, I have a few different topics I want to talk about. Um, as far as the timing of this, um, Mr. Zerker, you had mentioned that the fire department was the one that needed the space on this southern side of Prescott, correct? No, it was to, it was to comply with fire code and building code. It came okay, up during. So fire and building code. So that would have come up when you poured the concrete, correct? No, that came up, that access path came up during the permit phase of getting building permits issue and drug documents are going through final review. So um, from a timeline perspective, when was that? Yeah, it was issued in June. It was in June, sometime in June of last year, April, so, May, June. Okay, so that means that approximately seven or eight months ago, you knew that this shift needed to take place? I do, I, I do, and I we're now in January of 2019. We have four stories already filled, and it's only now being requested in front of the ZBA. That's point one. Um, one of the things that I haven't heard um, that I am concerned about is um, the state of um, snow removal, um, sight line, cars go, because if we're talking about potentially a two foot difference, this is already a challenging intersection, and there's a lot of pedestrian traffic through the train. So, I would be interested from the town perspective if any evaluation has been done as to what impact that shift in the building will have on that intersection and perhaps a street light is required. That's something I would hope that the ZBA would consider. Um, one of the things that one of the other residents mentioned was repercussions. So they have known, the developer has known about this for many, many months and are only bringing it before you now. My concern as far as precedent goes, um, is that 40 bees already have more leeway than other developments in town. By voting to have this be an insubstantial change, the message that you are communicating, um, perhaps unintentionally, is that developers, um, it's easier to beg for forgiveness than ask in advance. And to me, that's concerning because we have numerous other developments. So what liberties may other developers take because they know that the town will not take action because there are no repercussions that we will simply allow them to violate the terms of their agreement. Um, respectfully. Yeah. Just to clarify, because I, I came aware of this issue before, right before I sent the letter in. Now, maybe I should have picked up on it last year when it went through the whole process. But again, it went through the process. And 40B law specifically outlines knows that during 40Bs, it's a schematic plan and there are going to be slight changes. Some of those changes are increased units and, and other stuff like that. So I don't think what we're asking for is any of the ordinary the plan is still the same for all the snow removal, all the traffic is, is you know, th those plans are still the same. And, you know, it, it's, you know, certainly it, the ruling if it's insubstantial or substan substantial is, you know, what we're here for. But we didn't know about this, you know, was, there was no, this was, went through a lengthy, lengthy process with the town. And it, I admit, I didn't realize it until we went to get our ass built, and I said, oh, wow, something changed here. And when I went back to retrace what happened, because I'm not involved in the details of some of the construction drawings with the town officials and adding things, like you know, certain things, and if things changed slightly by inches. So when I became aware of it, we submitted the letter to you guys, and that's kind of where we are. So it wasn't, I didn't know about it for a year. We didn't have any ill intention of doing anything. You know, it's not fun for me to have to ex explain that, but when I realized it was a, you know, a slight change, I had to go back, retrace the steps, figure out where that was. So, and that's how we got here. Okay. Um, just before you say that, Chris, um, can you speak to the number of being involved in, in quite a few very uh, pieces? Can you speak to the um, the modifications or the not substantial versus the substantial uh, issues that come before ZBAs, whether it's this 
community or others? Because I know you're, you've been No, I've involved. done a fair amount. Um, it is <clears throat> very common for a 40B project that's been approved by ZBA to come back for to request modifications six months or a year after the permit's issued. Um, I don't know that I can specifically recall one um, that came in after construction was so far along. And I don't recall one that I've worked on um, that specifically dealt with setbacks. In addition to not knowing of one in my own personal experience that dealt with setbacks, there's not much in the way of Housing Appeals Committee case law that deals with modifications concerning setbacks. So um, this specific example is, I, I don't have any anecdotes to share that are going to be helpful. But as a more general matter, it is common, if not, um, you know, it is it is common for 40B projects to come back in for modifications at some point along the road. And the ones that I've seen range from uh, a shift from rental projects to condominiums or home ownership, or um, a shift from townhouses to small single family houses. So it can, it, the housing type can often change. Um, it, so, but there are any number of different varieties that you can see. Um, Sadly, I don't have a specific example on, on the setback front. Okay, that's good. And Andrew, uh, in terms of the sight line, uh, that was discussed um, quite a bit at, at our other hearings during the 40B process. And I don't remember the, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't remember um, the peer uh, reviewer indicating that there was a major problem that, that existed there in sight lines. Um, I believe you are correct. I don't recall hearing such a thing either. Um, I know during construction there was some concerns and the developer worked to address those with moving the trailer, setting up the mirror, et cetera, et cetera. But in the peer review, I do not believe there was a major concern on sight lines. OK. Um, I, I wasn't sworn in. I wasn't really prepared to. Uh, oh my um, so goodness, Chris! I, I swear I, I tell the whole truth. Um, so Barry Berman, member of the select board, but uh, resident of Longview Road. Um, the thing that there's a couple of things that concern me on this. Um, one is sort of um, Andrew. You alluded to there was a period of time from when we requested the as-builts to be done, where actually this stuff would have been picked up, right? I mean, obviously you can't pick it up on the schematics, but you can pick it up on the as-builts. There was a period of time where I believe the staff had asked maybe more than one time, where are they? Mr. Zucker, I think you said something about you changed surveyors. Um, so I, my, my question is, had, had we gotten those in a timely manner, would those have, obviously they would have been picked up faster um, would that have impacted the construct? You know, would that have impacted the construction, uh, or was it already four stories when we, when we had requested that? I am not sure how much was we had asked for them in June, I believe, originally. So I'm not sure how much construction was done at that time, but I don't believe it would have affected it in any way. Um, the permit was given. And um, so I, I guess my question is that if, if we need to, if we request something, we don't get it. Um, is, you know, is it appropriate for us to kind of take a step back and say, you know, until we get it and make determinations, we can't. We did receive bi-weekly reports from the development team. I believe that was required. Um, I was not included on those reports, so I'm not. I don't really which ones. I just no. I'm just trying to understand the process in terms of our responsibility as a. Uh, community to, to have oversight and then when something comes in and now um, you know uh, it's different from right the, the building department I believe still did do site visits we got week by weekly reports or monthly reports so we were in contact with them we did try to do our due diligence and maintain the need for the as built and we acknowledge that they did take time so but Perhaps you're right that it might have been caught sooner than you I mean, that's something just to, to jot down for future projects, as, as we all know that there are many on the way. My, my other concern, Mr. Chair, I, I, I direct this to you. 
I am, um, you know, a, a two or three feet more uh, pushing in front of Lincoln Street. Um, I drive that intersection a lot of the time, and I know that that's already a challenging, um, in, you know, intersection. So um, perhaps a, a path forward on this would, um, since um, when we did have the traffic look at it, it, it they did it assuming the setbacks would be a little bit further. Um, is it is it conceivable on your part to consider perhaps delaying any decision on this till some traffic person can go in there and render a decision? Because once it's built, it's built, and now we have a dangerous traffic situation. So the traffic situation potentially on something where it's you know, where it's pushed out so much further on Lincoln Street, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of it's kind of too late. So. Again, I know that there's a, a, click, a, click, a ticking clock in terms of when this board has to render a decision. I'm wondering if it's possible to get somebody out there just to kind of at least alleviate the fears of the neighbors um, that that um, uh, reduced setback will not impact any kind of visibility of traffic on that intersection. So that's just something to maybe ask. I don't have an answer to that there. Um, I can tell you that um, you certainly can't delay. I mean, we are, um, in essence, 10 days away from making the decision, gets, getting, trying to get somebody out there. That's a staff issue um, to do that. And then the next question is, what if you found out that there's a 1% chance or a 1.5% chance that that's going to render something? What are your options? you just tear down that corner of the building and rebuild it uh, and if that's the case then the applicant will go to mass housing and mass housing is going to make the decision one way or the other and then it's not even in our hands anymore so from my perspective it is it is uh, what we had at the time had it come up in June would it have made a, a major decision if the foundation permit had already been pulled and was uh, validated. Um, it, you couldn't do much after that when the con when the construction progressed. So, would we have been having this request for modification instead of in uh, in January? The, the modification would have been in uh, July or August. Um, I don't know. I mean. That's why this board is, is trying to make take all these things into account and figure out exactly what's best for uh, what we see as understanding the criteria for the 40A and the 40B because they are related. Um, and what's what is in the best interest of the town? That's the only reason we stand here and serve, just like the select board serves. So, um, so just one point of clarification, Kirk is referring to it as inches, as a few inches. We're talking about a few feet. There's a significant difference. It's about 24 inches. Um, so as far as the sight lines go, um, the studies that were done previously uh, were based off of the original plans, and now we're talking about losing one to two feet in the, on each of those streets. So the sight line um, studies that were done previously wouldn't necessarily apply to this so, um, to Mr. Bourbon's point, it would be helpful to have more information uh, as far as the safety goes. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but if this board were to uh, vote to make this, to, to note this as a substantial change, and this question may be better aimed at town council, um, could construction continue on this site while the public hearing were still in place or were scheduled? Uh, they could continue construction at risk that something yes they could, they could continue could, they could continue construction I, I, because I, I want to be clear here and saying no one is going to suggest that they tear down the building over a couple of years, right it's simply not um, however if the board were to indicate that this is a substantial change set the precedent that we do enforce our zoning bylaws um, that buys us the time as a community to conduct a safety study, to involve the abutters, and then decide what to do from there, potentially with conditions or not as this board sees fit. But it does buy us those 30 days. So respectfully, that would be my request. 
Andrew, I'm going to send it back to you. Uh, having been involved with the staff in study surveys, especially with traffic and sight lines and all the rest of it, what time, kind of time frame are we talking? Um, I can't say for sure, but I most likely wouldn't expect it in 30 days, but perhaps people who are do that work could squeeze it in, um, but I really can't say, um, to be honest. So, but 30 days is a short window in the planning and permitting world, as we've noted. Um, from the experience that I know that staff has gone through before, and the applicant may want to speak to this too, uh, I think it would be more like three to six months before right. <laughs> it could be completed, sent back to the town, reevaluated uh, in the peer review process. That's that's how it's gone on. That's why 40 Bs take so right. so long to begin right. with. You just can't go out there and say, okay, I know a perfect person. They're doing the 40 Bs all over the place. Right. But I just want to see what you come agree. up with. Just a real quick point of clarification on that, on some of the uh, line of sight issues. The stop sign coming out of the building is in the same exact spot. So when you're leaving the building, that line of sight is no different than where the building was before. You still have to stop and you still have the same line of sight that was there before. That that hasn't changed at all. So. Well, the building is completed. Because right now it's You know, and it's a whole separate point, but that she's, that's a very good point because I've noticed it up there, some of the construction line of sights coming out because where the construction fence is now, don't mean to sidetrack, is, is further out than obviously the, everything goes. It's probably at the edge of where the street will be, but there'll be sidewalks and everything. But there's poor signage there right now. And I've, you know, I've been part of that. I've almost got hit walking around there. So clearly it's a whole separate discussion, but that's a good point. But the stop signs when the building's complete will be in the exact same spot they were on the fence. It's not the stop sign, it's the issue. Oh. But for, for a line of sight, that's where you already pass the building when you come out and stop. You're already out of the building. Okay. Yes. Ken Chase, uh, Reading and Cam. Um, I, I also want to make the point that the Doucette Moving and Storage Building was on the property line, 199 feet long, along Prescott, 41 and a half feet high. Our building is further back and three feet higher at its highest point. On the Lincoln Street side, the Certainly Wood building was not only literally on top of and over the lot line on two of Butters um, properties, it was also on the lot line on the Lincoln Street side. So uh, the building as constructed now, as intended, <coughs> excuse me, and as constructed is further back from the from both streets than um, the uh, pre-existing structures that were there. Um, secondly, I just wanted to point out that the podium that we're depicting on the as-built is not obviously on the ground. Um, that is actually 11 feet in the air. So um, the parking is down beneath that, and I, I know you uh, members of the board uh, will, will recall this, but some of the uh, other folks here might not. Um, a lot of that area down below is wide open, and uh, there are windows there that it, it's not a, a solid facade. That's uh, and it's effectively an open garage with um, windows and, and breaks in it. So there are sight lines through that that facade there as well. Thank you. Uh, somebody who hasn't spoken before, yes. Hi, uh, Ed Ross, um, Kensington Avenue. Um, just to, um, you know, I, I kind of appreciate you know everyone's comments. I think uh, you know Mr. Berman and Mr. Alvarado made some made some great points. I think the one thing, I don't envy your position, um, being where you're given, you know, kind of certain information and you're working off of numbers and, and, and different things and been precedent. I think the, the, the most important thing to, to think of is that if I were in your position, I just wouldn't be able to have as much information as possible. And I think trying to make a decision whether it's substantial or insubstantial, based on just what I've heard and seen tonight, just doesn't seem like enough and you would need I know it would be a rush uh, to get some you know, to someone in there or anything else, but I would think you'd want as much information as possible, um, you know, to be able to 
move this move this forward. I think we, we all agree. I think at, at the end of the day, this building is going to be here. Um, and it got someone that uses that train stop, someone that drives down that street very frequently. I think you know, getting feet um, or inches, however it may be, it, it does matter when you're there. Um, you know, during construction and post construction, and I just think from the th from the aspect of wanting to make that decision, that I would I would just think that you'd want to have as much information as you could have before making that decision. I know that you all gave opinions um, to start. I'm just hoping that based on what the community is is relaying to you, um, and and what the developers have have, have, uh, have shared as well, that. In order to make that decision, to have as much information as you can, and I think some of those studies that uh, that, that both uh, uh, Mr. Berman and Mr. Alvarado mentioned would, would would help inform you and, and to make a decision that I think would represent what the community is looking for as well. Um, I'll take one more, preferably somebody who hasn't spoken. Okay. Caden Thomas's Arlington Street. I'm considered a debutter. Um, the first thing I want to say is that um, I, I, I very much appreciate the, the work that you do and, and the consideration that you have to give to this project and, and the long process that we all went through um, over uh, determining what would be uh, best on the site. And of course, your job largely is to manage uh, a complex set of needs of different groups in town. Um, and, uh, I thank you for that work. Um, I want to make it clear that, as far as I heard, um, the notion that any uh, member of the community is coming to you and suggesting that the building not be built um, is really false. Um, that's, that's not happened at all tonight. You are acting in good faith, I, I believe, and I would like to hope that you see that the residents of this town are also acting in good faith here. I, I I live around the corner on Arlington Street, and we this the snow removal of the town is a huge issue on my block. And in fact, we get a lot of snow from Prescott Street pushed down the block. So I, I feel that these changes are really going to impact day-to-day -day life um, as I see it and know it very well on on this site. Um, I, I'm I'm not. I learned about this about 24 hours ago. And um, I'm still trying to figure out what the heck is, is going on here. Um, and I don't even really know, like, it, it's, are you clear, has the building gotten larger? No. How do I, you know that? Like, how do you know from the back side? Like, what, I, I can't even. The footprint has already been determined. The footprint was determined when the foundation was poured. The building inspector, um, who's not here, the other commissioner, um, did go out and look at that and, and okayed that. That determined what the building was going to be. If there was any changes in that, there'll be an occupancy permit that is issued on the building. The, the new building commissioner will be probably very much involved in that, if not the combination with the former, well, part-time building commissioner who we have. The bottom line is that, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is the building increased in size? Yes. It can't. It cannot because the documents, which is the detailed engineering plans, that's what the board approved of. It cannot move forward. The as built, the as built is twofold. It is as it goes forward, but the first of the as built is when the foundation was put in. And then the rest of the as built is when the building is complete. Otherwise, you cannot get a building occupancy permit. Okay, so I don't know how it is that we're here today after many months of this, like this kind of being obvious or known, and that the town is making claims about the measurements. I, I, I don't feel confident that we really know what's going on on the site. And I'm not alone in that concern. My neighbors couldn't show up. We, you know, we're, we're a transitional neighborhood in, in every possible way. These, you know, my neighbors are working people. They cannot simply drop everything to come to this meeting. And we've, we, we've, we've not really been had the time to process the information. I, 
I beg you to please give this real consideration because I, I think we're, we're, we're missing something here and, and I don't know what it is. I, I, I was before you a couple months ago um, letting you know that I was concerned about this site. And I said, no, that, that site work means on a regular basis. Uh, that are ongoing site, which is not what we're reviewing tonight. And I want to respect that. I, I absolutely do. Thank you. But please, I beg you to see this as something that is, is significant to the community. And not only on this site, these are lessons that will be learned and impact the whole community, all of the other 40 B projects. You are sending a message, not only within the town, but to every developer who is watching right now. Please, I, I beg you to really consider all of the factors and the implications and the, and the, and the potential ramifications of the decision that you, that you will be making. Matt, if, if I would correct me again. We had a box, which you're going to put things into, but we had a box. Through the permit process, 40B, we decided what that box was going to be. We thought it was going to be in this particular location on the property, on the site. What we're asking for, what you're asking for is that box got shifted a little bit instead of being exactly where it was on the original plans. That's what the question is for this evening. That's all it is. All the rest of it that you're concerned about needs to go to staff. And I would say that my, my point would be to ask Matt, um, would you be a more friendly uh, developer in listening to concerns and working with staff so that these things don't come forward to us. And it's not, it's I, I not just, you, it's not that everyone will say that that's not what we're doing. But I know. I got four calls yesterday on cars and I appreciate that. And I went out there myself and I yelled at people and, and I told, you know, I, I, like that type of stuff, I, I do, I, it, it's, I, it's no fun for the neighbors to have to patrol that. It's no fun for me to have to patrol that. As much as you tell someone, don't park there, don't park there, don't park there, the next day they park there. We've been actually carpooling people in. Um, we've got plenty of parking under the building now, so I'll say I'll, I try to do my best, and I know everyone won't believe that, but I sincerely try to do my best. Try to have meetings at different morning times, at night times. So happy to take suggestions. I'm not perfect, and we make mistakes. This, I, if, if I had seen this a year ago when we went to the building permit plan, it's not that we didn't build what we got approved at the permit phase, it's that there were some slight tweaks to the box for a number of reasons, and you know, and that I, is an apology. It wasn't a, I didn't know about this until we finally got the as built. That took a while from the engineering company. They're busy, it's everyone in this industry is busy. So when I came aware of it, I, contacted the town, I talked to them, I figured, I said, I'm gonna write the letter, I got the letter in, so, um, but that's the long-winded answer to um, do my best on trying to address any other issue okay. that comes up. Okay, I appreciate that. I think at this point, uh, we'll close the subject matter of the public hearing. Uh, it'll be up to the board then to discuss the concerns that they have and take a vote. I'd like to get this resolved this evening so that we don't miss our everything in 40A and 40B is time stamped. Um, I don't want to miss a date. And I know the board doesn't want to miss a date and staff doesn't want to miss a date. So, um, questions or concerns? Uh, and if no one has something that they want to mention right now, I need to have somebody make a motion I'd like to make a comment. Okay. As I said earlier, I did not vote for this project at the outset a year ago. I thought it was too big, even though they took one floor off. Just think if you had another floor on there. They took one floor off, okay. I don't think anybody envisioned what the ultimate size of that project would be in that location. It's huge. And I hear all the concerns here tonight. I heard them before. I don't think the changes that are being talked about here are going to change those concerns. The concerns are there whether you do this, make this decision or not. They're there, they're going to stay there. Okay? That's my view. 
and, and I think we've strayed a little bit tonight in some cases away from what we're being truly asked to do here. We're not asking to redesign the project. We're being asked to determine whether or not what the developers come forth with is a substantial or insubstantial change in the overall context of the project. That's the decision that we're faced with making tonight. And I'll just stop it right there and let, Thank you, sir. let us hear from some of the other comments. I'm also, I, I, I Nick? made my statement. Just to echo what Sai's saying, I think, I mean, ideally, if we didn't grant a variance, the buy right setback is 20 feet. We're, no, we're, we're already far from 20 feet. And I think it's not inches, it's a couple more feet. I don't think it's really going to affect the traffic, the, the footprint, and all the other concerns. So when I take the whole thing and look at the, the, the whole scope, I still come back to this being insignificant. I have no further comment. I have been expressed already. Okay. Then I'll accept a uh, motion. Um, it seems that. Um, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but uh, I can make one. Okay, I love that. I would move to grant the petitioner New Meadow Development a finding that the requested change to waiver number nine of the MGL Chapter 40 yeah. B Comprehensive Permit Decision dated February 23rd, 2017. Regarding the change to front yard setbacks on Prescott Street from 5.8 to 3.2 and 3.2 feet to the overhead balcony, and also on Lincoln from 5.8 to 3.3, constitute an insubstantial change to the existing comprehensive decision. Do we have a second to that? A second. Nick, second. Any discussion? And we're ready for a vote. All in favor of the motion before us. Any objections? So we have a vote of four to one. We needed a minimum of a three to two to pass it. Either either way, it came up to be four to one. And I, I would I would ask Matt if you would um, stay in touch with staff. Um, maybe make a more of an effort to. Um, to get issues that are not part of this hearing this evening resolved. Um, okay. Everyone wants to schedule a neighborhood meeting coming up that's the most convenient time that the most people will go to. I'm more than happy to be there. Okay. You got that, Andrew? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. We have two more. Actually, we have two hearings before us this evening. Chris, um, would you mind putting that in a formal? Yeah, I can do a letter. You can go out over your signature. Um, and I don't, I don't mind you um, signing it on behalf of the board either. Okay, I'll give you that. The, the board. It's fine. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I copy your? Can I copy your motion? Can I copy your motion? Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's the petitioners. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, no, I only do that because Chris is our um, yeah, I don't know what I'm town council. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. Um. This is case number 19-01, Azalea Circle. The Zoning Board of Appeals will hold a public hearing in the Selectman's Meeting Room, Town Hall, uh, 16 Wall Street, Reading, Mass, on Wednesday, the 16th of April, 2019, at 7 p.m. under the application of uh, K Street, Reading Realty, LLC, pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 48, Section 9, for a special permit under the Zoning Bylaws, 5.3.2 and 5.4.7 to construct an attached accessory apartment contained within the new construction of a single family dwelling at the property located at 0 Azalea Lane. Assessor's map 23, lots 125 and 126 in Reading. Unless there's an objection, I will dispense with the reading of the abutters list except to say that the abutters were notified as were the following. Board of Selectmen, Police Department, Building Department, Town Court, Fire Department, Conservation Commission, Health Department, Engineering Department, Assessor's Office, members and associate members of the Board of Appeals, as well as the Planning Boards of Wakefield, North Reading, Woodward, Linfield, Stoneham, and Wilmington. Testimony given before this board is taken under oath, so if you think you may wish to speak, please stand and raise your hand. Ginny, you're the only one that's going to speak besides... Uh, <laughs> okay. I may or may not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you swear to testimony again before this board is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Um, this is uh, another first for me, Stephen, that we have uh, really uh, an application before us, which I don't think you're going to present this evening. All you're doing is coming in to extend the, or, or is am I incorrect on that? Is this the same, sir? I don't believe an applicant is here as they requested a continuance until March 20th. And that's what I'm, coming before this board, it, I don't remember a case that came in with one question, can we have a continuance until two months in advance? Why are we doing this? So as the applicant had explained to me, he felt that according to the state regulations on Wetlands Protections Act that they had to file an application with CBA and open the hearing to continue and finish with the conservation hearing. Through discussions with staff, they might have had to file, but potentially not open, but there is no harm, no foul in opening the case and continuing it into March 20th, as that's within the 90-day period to issue a decision from opening, and they will, they are appearing before the Conservation Board, I believe, next Wednesday, I want to say, um, to hopefully wrap up that process and then go for it and then continue with us. And they would have continued to a sooner date than March 20th. Unfortunately, the early February date did not work for them. Late February doesn't work for us, given the 40B. And so we continued until March, um, given all of those conflicts with scheduling. We thought that was appropriate to give them time to address any concerns and continue from there. Mm. Okay. Sorry about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the request is for continuance to the 20th of March. Mm -hmm. Uh, this time at uh, 7 o'clock, mm -hmm. this location. Mm -hmm. And we take uh, the interest of the ap applicant under advisement. So, um, do we have uh, any concerns? If not, do we have a motion to continue the subject matter of this hearing until the 20th of March? Nope. We're, we're talking case number 1901, right? Correct. Yes. Azalea Circle. Yes. Correct. Okay. Azalea Circle. Okay. That's, I got messed up. With yeah, no problem. I think I apologize. We, to have, we haven't opened it to the public yet. I can't. I, no, I that's, can't. All, that's all. I was just 
I was a bit confused. Virginia, I can't even open the public hearing section because we haven't officially opened the hearing. We know personal privilege. <laughs> Let's hear the personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't understand why this wasn't posted that there was going to be a continuation because generally um, most of the boards do that. Um, is there any reason why that was not posted? We got here. I don't know. We'd have to ask. The Virginia. agenda was posted, and then after determining that they weren't finalized with CONCOM yet, that they would be electing to continue. So, And so most boards make a notice on the website or on their printouts saying that the process is going to be continued. And it would have been an advantage for uh, some people to be notified of that. I do apologize. Okay, do we have a motion? Oh, okay. Now, to March what? 20th. 20th. <coughs> so you, moved. You did open it, right? I did. You yeah. Did, did, you did vote to open it? I did open it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll make a motion to uh, continue at the applicant's request to March 20th, 2019. I have a second to that. Second? Okay. Have a second. Any discussion? No discussion. All in favor? Five zero zero. Okay. 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 The uh, Next hearing, case number 1902, Meadowbrook Golf Club, Zoning Board of Appeals will hold a public hearing in the Clarkman's Meeting Room at Town Hall, 16 Wall Street, Reading, Mass., on Wednesday, the 16th of January, 2019, at 7 p.m., on the application of Stephen A. Ciccatelli, pursuant to Mass. General Laws, or pursuant to Reading Zoning Bylaws, 4.6.10, to appeal the Community and Planning and Development Commission site plan review decision on approval and raise the reconstruct the clubhouse on the property located at 292, um, aka 288 Grove Street, Assessors Map 37, floor, and Reading, Massachusetts. Um, I will dispense with the reading uh, of the uh, butters list. Um, uh, but they were notified as well as the Board of Selectmen, the Town Clerk, Police Department, and Fire Department, Building Department, and Conservation, Health Department, Assessor's Office, Engineering Division, CPDC, members and associate members of the Board of Appeals, as well as the Planning Board of Wakefield, North Reading, Woburn, Linfield, Stone, and Wilmington. Testimony given before this Board is taken under oath, so if you think you may wish to speak tonight, please stand and raise your right hand. It's very good. No one's gonna go. Okay. No common sense in the public section on this, right? So I stood up. I stood at the beginning. Oh, okay. You took took the oath already. Okay. Uh, Chair, just a point of order, just for the record. Uh, my name is Attorney Brian Brunel. I represent Red Oak Road. I just wanted to go here on behalf. Great. Thank Great. You. Um, are you gonna make a presentation this evening? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Um, he, is the uh, the applicant here this evening too? Yes, Mr. Oh, yes. I just had two questions for you. Um, number one, um, how long do you know how long the uh, Meadowbrook Golf Club has been there? Yes, 1898. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Incorporated 1902. And and. In the house that you're living in right now, which is a, a direct abutter to the golf course. Um, um, I'm diag diagonally across from the entrance. Well, yeah. across the street, direct yeah. abutter. Um, how long have you lived in that house? Uh, 30, it'll be 37 years in April. And uh, were you the original builder? No. Uh, you built, you purchased the property afterwards, right? Yeah, it was built in 62. And I purchased in '82. Okay. Um, I just had a, had a question. You had a second question. No, I, I was going to say, um, 
you know, as, as we get into this, it seems like the golf course kind of preceded you and all the people down there. And uh, Stephen's going to present right now exactly what your request is yeah. because we don't even know what you're requesting. You can't. You can't. We're not going to. We're not going to review the entire site plan review. So there's must, well, something specific that you want. Please tell us what that is. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, for the record, uh, Stephen Chikatilo, Grove Street. Um, and again, as the chair has um, has mentioned, the property is uh, right across from the entrance to uh, to Meadowbrook. Uh, we're here this evening uh, on an appeal, and, and it's a rather obscure section of the zoning bylaw, uh, 4610, which indicates a person aggrieved by a decision of the CPDC may appeal to the Board of Appeals. Uh, it's rather unique to have lateral appeals or administrative appeals. Mm. Uh, as the board is aware, a person aggrieved of a decision of a special permit granting authority under Chapter 40A, uh, Section 17, has a venue or right of appeal uh, to the Superior Court. So we're here uh, out of respect for the board and out of respect for the bylaw, and quite frankly, in an abundance of, um, of, of, of caution, because we do not want to be accused of uh, evading or avoiding any of the local administrative appeals. Um, we have also filed a complaint with the Superior Court, but quite frankly, we we're in a catch-22 position. If we didn't file the appeal with this board, we could be accused of not exhausting local administrative remedies. If we didn't file, uh, if we filed with this board and didn't file with Superior Court, we potentially could waive the rights of appeal. So uh, I'm going to be brief because I don't really know that we should be here, and, and I obviously do not expect this board to do a rehearing of what the CPDC did over probably a one year. A one-year period. So what I want to touch on basically is some procedural and jurisdictional issues. Uh, I want to address the issue of uh, an expansion of a non-conforming use. My client understands that the present uh, golf club is a non-conforming use. And then I, I want to address uh, a few conditions uh, that, that we feel should have been contained in the decision. And I think we, at a minimum we have to do that because what we're asking you to do, technically under your bylaw, is to overturn uh, the site plan approval uh, issued by the CPDC. Uh, on a jurisdictional issue, uh, if, if you look at the packet that I gave you, uh, the, the relevant statute is Chapter 48, Section 6, which basically states that when you have a non-conforming use, that use may be altered or, or changed, uh, providing the proposed alteration change expansion is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conformity. Uh, what Meadowbrook is proposing is to basically raise the existing clubhouse, build a new clubhouse, uh, a few feet back, but basically on the same, uh, at the same location, uh, with the a very large, expansive outdoor deck. So that's what's being proposed. That was the subject of the site plan hearing. Uh, in the packet I just gave you, there is a copy of a 1995 Board of Appeals uh, decision where the uh, attorney at the time, Attorney Latham, came before this board. This was for the construction of the pro shop, a small 1,400 square foot building. And this board was asked to Chapter 48, Section 6. And, and you did a decision that you did not feel that was an impermissible expansion. Um, that, I would respectfully submit, is what should have happened in, in the instant case, uh, but it did not. Uh, what happened, if you look at the next uh, uh, document. It's a letter uh, from uh, from Chris Town Council, uh, basically opining that uh, in, in in applying the standard, the Powers case, as affirmed by the Cumberland Farms case, it was his opinion based on the information he was given, and I want to be very clear on that um, that it was a permissible expansion. Now, my, my issue, my client's issue, really is this: um, I we feel that the uh, authority and jurisdiction of this board w were circumvented based on unilateral communications between the applicant and town council. Uh, 
we were not privy to those communications. There was information that was provided that we feel was inaccurate relating to the present usage. And again, you have to look at what is existing now to determine if it's a permissible expansion. Uh, there's an outline that my client has in here uh, that basically indicates the, the various inconsistencies. And again, he's very familiar with the club having been a member. Uh, and I would just draw your attention to one at the very end regarding the outdoor deck. Uh, the questions that were asked regarding the existing deck, it's how it's used, uh, not the character and use of the existing uh, proposed deck, I'm sorry, the existing deck, which is unlighted, uncovered, and actually closes at dusk, not 9 p.m., which is uh, the provision in the decision. Nor is it used for events or functions. The proposed outdoor space is more than twice as large than the existing, uh, are covered, lighted, and will be used for events and functions. It is a major change that will have more of a detrimental impact on nearby residential homes. Um, again, the decision, if it's uh, an opinion letter, if it's based on incorrect information, by definition, could be incorrect. And that's really uh, our position. That type of discussion, that type of, the, the type of questions the town council asked, which were all legitimate, and the answers that were given, that should have been in a public forum. It was not. In fact, my client and I, on numerous occasions, asked for copies of that, those correspondence. And we were told by the town planner, the assistant planner, and the assistant town manager that those were privileged attorney-client privilege communications, and we could not have them. That, that, that to me, is not appropriate in, in the course of a public hearing. So we give you this outline that basically contradicts information that was provided to town council, but we did not have the opportunity to do that before this opinion letter was, uh, was drafted. Um, so that's the first issue. Again, this matter should have been before, before your board. What was applied uh, by town council, I believe correctly, is the powers test uh, and, and then the Cumberland Farms test. And again, basically the issue is it's not a question of whether the building is slightly larger. In fact, Cumberland Farms was quite clear. In many cases, to comply with improved building codes, you have to rebuild the building. So we fully understand that. Uh, the size of the building is not critical. It's the quality and character of the use. When you look at the new building, uh, if, if you look at the, the way it can be used, in terms of the ability to host more functions, but, but most critically, the outdoor deck. That outdoor deck is quite large, it's open, it's uncovered, and basically that will be used, it will most certainly be the subject of a common victorless license and, and liquor license, and during the summer that's gonna create a lot more noise. So my client's been there 40 years, he, is, he hears noise from the very small deck that's, that exists now. That, that and the ability of increased function activity because of the redesign of the building, we would respectfully submit under Powers and Cumberland Farms is an expansion or a change in the quality and character of the use. Again, that should have been brought to you. You should have had the ability to elicit facts, have the abutters question those facts and make an opinion, and again, it never happened. The Cumberland Farms case, I, I don't think, quite frankly, should have even applied because it's a very different fact pattern. That is a commercial use in a commercial district and basically the use didn't change. We have a commercial use in a residential district and we see a change that we feel is quite substantial with the outdoor deck. In the decision, and I'm not gonna go through the whole decision, but um, if you look at a memo that was, it's at the very back of your packet, this was issued in August of 2017 by the CPDC to the applicant because at the time the CPDC felt the application was far from complete. Item six requires a complete traffic study. Item eight calls for a parking mitigation plan to be provided. And item 10 calls for a feasibility study relative to pushing the building back. The use is there, it is grandfather. But when you're raising a building, which now is about 20 feet from the street, and the fact that you're moving it back to 30 feet is really immaterial, you have the opportunity, and the CPDC saw this at least in August in 2017, to push the building back. Now you solve the noise problem. The deck is farther away from all the abutters. You now have parking, which is sorely lacking in that area. And also you have the ability for queuing. 
for uh, truck deliveries. Uh, none of that was done. In the final decision, they waived the parking mitigation plan. They waived the traffic uh, study requirement and the building was allowed to stay basically where it was proposed which is a few feet back from where it is now um, in the decision and I think this was addressed in attorney Heap's letter there was the, the issue of public versus private events the only restrictions contained in the very long CPDC decision relate to private events club events public events are wide open. There are absolutely no, no restrictions. So we feel that is a, uh, a serious uh, uh, problem with the decision. And again, that coupled with the outdoor deck, uh, it's going to create impact that does not exist now. It's a change in the quality and character uh, of the use. This facility, we would respectfully submit, is changing from a club to a fun function facility. And again, uh, parking is not being uh, provided for. There are no restrictions for public or club events. Uh, parking, keep in mind, has been reduced because there was inappropriate parking on actually the public way head on. That now has all been reduced with curbing, so now it'll be parallel. So with all this, with all these changes, with all the expansion, we now have actually less parking on, on Grove Street. So at, in, in summary, at the end of the day, we would respectfully submit that the CPDC did not have jurisdiction to entertain a site plan application because this board uh, was not given jurisdiction to make a uh, chapter 40A section 6 finding. So you have one request, if I'm hearing correctly. You want the You would like this board to rehear the site plan review. I, I really don't know what section 4610 uh, allows you to do. My, my, my belief is you have three options. You could affirm the uh, CPDC decision. You could overturn the CPDC decision. Uh, or you could um, modify the CPDC decision. I don't know if this, I don't know if you've heard this type of an appeal before. Again, uh, it, to, to me it's a bit odd. It creates a little bit of confusion. And I know the board would probably feel uncomfortable uh, overturning a decision of a fellow board. Uh, I, I know your opinion in terms of uh, following uh, opinions of town council, um, I understand that. So my the point that I'm trying to make is the the, the bylaw is there. Uh, I'm not quite sure why it's there. We simply feel that we have to be here. I don't know what else we would ask for other than for you to uh, overturn the decision um, or, or we call for a hearing on the uh, the section six uh, use. Um, and, and, and again, with all due respect to town council, you, there is a, a letter of town council in here, but to me, that's not the way this town is typically handled uh, Section 6 findings. Typically, they have appeared in front of your board, and you, you make that determination. Is there an impermissible expansion? What is the impact? Is it substantially more detrimental? That's up to you. Uh, but again, I believe the information that was provided to town council was done on a unilateral basis. I don't feel that's appropriate. This should all be in the open in the form of a public hearing. Um, and, and again, you actually, Mr. Chairman, you, you were on that, that prior decision, so I know you're very familiar with the process. Um, you know, if questions are going to be asked, and, and again, my, my client can go over the outline in detail, but, you know, uh, again, hours of operation, they weren't correctly stated, and, and, and that's what Chris based his opinion on. So I'm not faulting town council at all. Um, but again, I think that should have been done in the open. This board had jurisdiction, not the CPDC. I can tell you that that was, I think, inserted in um, 2016 or 2017, that last portion of uh, 6410, was it? It was probably designed to help a petitioner to maybe avoid going to court. Um, 
Yeah. I'm going to go right to, to town council on this. Um, <laughs> Unless the board. Yeah, sure. I'll have a bunch of comments, but if I, if I could just ask a couple questions of the appellant. First. Absolutely. Um, I just want to make sure I have a comprehensive list of the grounds that you are stating or arguing in support of some relief. The first one that I heard is, I think, the major one, which is that there was some error in a determination as to what relief they needed. And I think you, you're saying they needed a Section 6 finding. We didn't. None was required, so that's error number one. Is that fair? a fair yes. characterization? Okay, you, but I want to make sure I got, I have on my list any others that we need to uh, concern ourselves with. There was a reference to not requiring a traffic study. Okay. Um, there was a reference to not requiring parking mitigation. Is that correct? And there was a reference to an expansion of private events at the club. Um, are there any other grounds that I haven't listed to form a basis for your appeal? There are many, and as you know, this state of the complaint, so I'm not going to box myself in. That complaint is not, that complaint is sitting in Superior Court, and that is not before this board. I, I, so I, I, need, I, need, I need you to state clearly each and every ground that forms a basis for your appeal to this board so that we understand what it is you're arguing and what we need to decide. So that I had four there. Um, are there any others tonight? Yes, and they stated in the complaint, and I filed a complaint with this board. Uh, we, we feel the decision was of the CPDC was arbitrary, precious, based on legally untenable ground. Again, I, I, I'm not going to go into every single reason. I wanted to make this brief. Uh, I, out of respect for the board, I did not want to, I don't want to go through an entire hearing process, uh, but we have a lot of issues with the decision. I'm just highlighting some of the major ones, uh, but I think the main issue and the reason why I think this board should overturn the decision is that they had jurisdiction over this matter and they weren't given jurisdiction. Uh, this is a, uh, a Section 6 finding. They have jurisdiction. They've exercised jurisdiction relative to this uh, property before, uh, but quite frankly, a much smaller project. Um, and. Um, I think they should still have jurisdiction. I don't think you should you, you get to the site plan hearing at all. I, I, that's really a moot issue. I don't think the CPDC had uh, jurisdiction. I think you should concentrate on why this matter wasn't put before this board. And again, the section is very odd. Uh, I know it's an odd request, but that's what the section provides for you to overturn another board's decision. But um, if the matter had come to you first, we wouldn't be in front of that other board. So I'm trying to pare this down and, 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 and not, again, have you go through a full site plan hearing. It's not, in fact, if you look at your prior decision in 95, uh, you make the uh, Section 6 finding and then you specifically remind the uh, applicant uh, that they must find with the CPDC for site plan approval. So I don't expect you to conduct site plan approval, but uh, the main issue is the use. I don't think this was properly before the CPDC, and for that reason, among others, the decision should be overturned. Respect. Chairman, may I? I do not. It's not usual, but this whole night has not been used. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference here. I mean, and if I, I, could just, I could just add one, one, one additional um, comment. Um, in, in response to the arguments that have been presented tonight, it is. If something requires a Section 6 finding for expansion of a non-conforming use, it's a two-part question. And the first question is whether there has indeed been an expansion of that use. And that's a, a question that you analyze under the powers test, which was spoken to tonight. It's, it's a three-part test, and you look, you apply that three-part test to see if there's been an expansion. And that, the three-part three test is? Uh, whether the... Pr the use that's been proposed reflects the nature and use prevailing when the zoning bylaw took effect. That is, when the, when the use became non-conforming in the first place. Um, whether there is a difference in quality or character, as well as the degree of the use. Um, and whether the use is different in kind in its effect on the neighborhood. Um, so it's three prongs, but it's essentially, is it, is it bigger 
worse or different. I mean, I, is sort of how I put it. Um, but that question really is an administrative one that is normally tackled by the building commissioner, not 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 this board. And it's only if there's an affirmative finding, an affirmative response to that question, which is you know, applying that three prong test. Yes, there is an expansion that something comes to this board, because then you need to, this board needs to decide, um, is the new use that's been proposed, which is an expansion, not more detrimental to the neighborhood yeah, than the original use? That is absolutely something that this board would find, provided there had been an expansion. Uh, but what was done to reconstruct the Meadowbrook Clubhouse <coughs> was first in front of staff and the building commissioner, and then ultimately the CPDC. Um, staff was wrestling with the question of is this an expansion or not so there was communication between myself and and, and uh attorney mcgrail in an attempt to answer that question and we asked for them more information uh, about what they were what they were currently doing versus what they were proposing to do as part of this reconstruction of the clubhouse um, we had several specific requests for information and they provided it um, which ultimately resulted in a letter dated May 8, 2018, from me to the building commissioner, um, saying that based on the information that I had seen about the proposed reconstruction, it didn't appear to me as though what they were doing was so substantially different from what had been going on there forever um, to constitute an expansion. The footprint of the building wasn't increasing. Um, the uh, total occupancy of the building wasn't increasing. The hours of operation were going to stay exactly the same. Um, so we're, you know, in an attempt to hold up what they had had for years versus what they were proposing, it seemed to us that what they were proposing was um, consistent and therefore not an expansion. That letter was in the record during the CPDC's site plan review hearing. Um, and uh, I attended in at least one section of that one, the one where they made their decision. And it, 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 I can relay that the CPDC found on their, I think on their own, I'd like to say they relied on my letter, but I think they had exercised their own judgment and um, came to the conclusion on their own, having sat through a site plan review hearing for several months. Um, they seemed comfortable with the idea that this was not an expansion of a pre-existing not conforming use, but rather a, a reconstruction, which is okay, as long as it's not bigger or worse. Um, and having made that determination, issued a site plan review decision that attempted, I think, to capture all of the things that the applicant had, Meadowbrook, had said during the public hearing, which is our hours of operation aren't going to be substantially different. The occupancy is going to be less. The footprint, you know, is going to be about the same. So the site plan review decision, if you go through it, I think it pins Meadowbrook down in many regards to the sort of numbers that they that have existed for years um, so that they won't expand or get worse. So I think that's what I did, that's what the CPDC did, and that's partially what, the, what you know, Meadowbrook presented during the public hearing. The only other thing I'd add, I think, is that it's possible, what we have now is a proposed clubhouse from Meadowbrook, and in my review, based on the information that I had in front of me, it didn't appear to be an expansion. But let's say hypothetically, two years from now, they've built this clubhouse, and they're you know, holding events till 3 o'clock in the morning, or their occupancy has doubled or tripled. Nothing would prevent the building commissioner from that point, three years down the road, from saying, you have expanded your non-conforming use, and you've done it without a Section 6 finding, so therefore you need to come back to the ZBA and apply for that. It, it, it's not, um, you know, it's something we can look at now, but there is some safety valve in place if this were ever to become a true expansion of a non-conforming use for further enforcement down the road. Nothing that the CPDC did or that you're doing would foreclose some additional enforcement if this site truly did expand further on down the road. So I think that's just my, summa my summary of what's happened so far. Happy to answer any questions, but that's, that's how we got where we're at. But, but, but that, that, if I may, through the chair, that your opinion and the CPDC's finding is based on the information submitted. For example, hours of operation, and again, my client can do this much more eloquently than I can. The hours of operation that you were given, we don't believe are correct. 
and, and that's that's really the issue. That's an interesting issue. And, and again, I'm not faulting you, or, or even quite, quite frankly, the CPDC for that. But you know, information is given, and you have to look at what it exists now versus what is proposed. And to say it's going to stay the same, well, if it's not staying the same because what what was given to you in the actual hours of operation that exist are not the same. Because hours of operation just being one issue. Uh, where functions are held on outside deck. There's a variety of them. Again, my client submitted several outlines to the CPDC trying to correct those facts, and they're all on the record, but they they, they just weren't considered, I guess. But um, and, and again, some of those are in the outline I gave you this evening, but that's really our issue. Yes, based on the facts that uh, the town council was given, I understand the opinion that he came to, but uh, we, we feel the facts were not correct. Go ahead. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Brian McGrail. I'm an attorney with offices at 599 North Ave, right over the line in Whitefield. I represent Meadowbrook. Um, I, I, I'm a little bit confused on what I'm hearing tonight, some of these comments, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, like Town Council, am kind of confused by what they're asking for. Uh, we just received this memo a few minutes ago, so obviously I haven't had a chance to, to go through it. I will tell you that when Attorney Cecatelli says is the CPDC did not listen to his client, there's nothing accurate about that whatsoever. There was a tremendous amount of testimony before the CPDC um, on this matter. And his client, he testified, and his client testified, and the CPDC weighed that information and vetted it. In, in, in extreme detail and is is laid out um, in their decision and um, you know looking at the major issue that's been raised tonight is, is the procedural act aspect of the 40a section 6 finding the decision that was given to you back in 1995 was something totally different that was the construction of a pro shop a new building on the site not the replacement of a building which is basically the same size. Not only is this building being re reconstructed basically the same size, we think a little bit smaller, uh, but it's actually being brought into compliance with zoning. Right now, the current clubhouse doesn't conform to setbacks. This will conform to the setback requirements um, under the bylaw. And the, the basis of the CPDC decision that a, that a uh, 48 Section 6 finding wasn't required for this project wasn't just based on correspondence with town council and his, his recommendation of what he reviewed, what the administrative staff. It was vetted and discussed in detail at the CPDC hearing. They made the finding. They made the finding with town council's advice. They made the finding based on information that was submitted at the hearing by us, by them. They then went to put conditions on the site plan approval to make sure that there wouldn't be an, a substantial expansion or exchange or, or a change in use. They put huge limitations on Meadowbrook who voluntarily accepted those conditions to make sure they limited the number of events, et cetera. When you, um, when you actually look at the decision, they have a specific paragraph on this, and they say special permit determination. And if I could, I'll quote, based on information provided by the applicant and applicant's attorney, along with testimony and evidence submitted at the public hearing, in documents herein regarding the nature and use of the proposed new clubhouse compared to the existing clubhouse, the commission, in consultation with town council, who was at the hearing, as town council said, determined that the proposed clubhouse is similar in quality, character, and degree to the existing clubhouse use. The CPDC further determined that the proposed new clubhouse will not have any appreciably different effect on the neighborhood, the existing clubhouse, and such will not result, will not result in a change or substantial extension of the legal non-conforming use. Thus, the applicant does not need a special permit for the proposed clubhouse project described here. And, and they actually went into detail. They said, this determination is supported by the fact that, one, the proposed new clubhouse is approximately the same size as the existing clubhouse. Two, the legal occupancy load of the proposed new clubhouse is significantly less than the existing clubhouse. It'll hold fewer people. The 
conditions in this decision will limit the number of allowed seats in the proposed new clubhouse, including the terrace and pool porch. So they referenced the porch and the patio. They limited the number of seating out there. They limited the hours of, out there to be consistent with those in the existing clubhouse. And four, the conditions in this decision will limit the number for year and size of private functions, events, and the proposed new clubhouse so as to be consistent with those occurring in the existing clubhouse. And five, the conditions in this decision will limit the operating hours of the proposed new clubhouse so, to be, so as to be consistent. So this was this was vetted. This wasn't like you know send a letter and we made this all misrepresentations to town council which came which came out with this ruling. No, this was vetted by and looked at the detail by CPDC in consultation with administrative staff and town council. They made the finding. Um, so you know it was looked at uh, in, in true uh, in absolute uh, detail. The other part of it is. Under 48 Section 6 finding, the only time a powers test is triggered is if there is a substantial expansion or change. That, then the test gets triggered. If there's no substantial expansion or change, no special permit is needed, no finding is needed. I stress the word substantial. Substantial expansion. Substantial extension. And obviously there isn't. It's the same size club hustle, less occupancy. Substantial, there can be changes in hours. You don't have to be exact if they're reasonable, which the CPDC determined. There was discussion on one of the decks that, you know, there was discussion that the, 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 um, the abutters uh, wanted it uh, not available after 3 o'clock, and the CPDC said, no, we don't think that's reasonable. 9 o'clock is fine. It's not, it's not substantial change, not a major effect. So this was vetted very uh, in, in great detail. And you look at the decision, there's a lot of conditions, a lot of thought that went into this. And you know, so that's where we are. We think this, the appeal should be denied. And the CPDC decision is done. Uh, I, I have a question for Attorney uh, Ciccatelli. You, in, in your verbal introduction there, you said that this was public and private. As far as I know, this is a private club, right? The public uh, can't drive off the street and go play golf or drive off the street and go to the bar or anything like that. This is a private club, no, is it not? No, no, I did not say that. What I said was the restrictions in the decision that Brian just alluded to only relate to private events. There are no restrictions for any club events. They use the term public club, whatever they want to call it. So I the think only you restrictions the term that public. the CPDC yeah. put on for private events that is a wedding. So the club members, they can do whatever they want, whatever they want to do it, providing licensing is, is you know, respected in terms of right. the license. But there are no restrictions relative to the club. If the club wants to have functions, if you call that public, whatever you want to call it. So private just refers to an outside body coming in. So so no, there are, there are no legitimate restrictions. All, all they restricted was private events, that's it. So they can do a lot more. And again, there's a big outside deck that doesn't exist uh, there. Uh, and, and in terms of the testimony, yes, there was testimony from the petitioner. So the petitioner gave facts, and we're just saying that those facts are not accurate in terms of existing usage, existing hours of operation. Mm -hmm. And that's what town council based his opinion on. That's what the CPDC. Uh, Brian made a, a very interesting point. What's particularly upsetting for my client is, in, in, you've been in this position. If an applicant is willing to stipulate to a condition, and that condition is to address a direct concern that an abutter has, why as a commissioner on board wouldn't you go along with it? So we had the applicant agreeing to something we had asked for, which was the 3% closure of one of the decks, actually both of the decks, and the board members said no. Even though the applicant was willing to stipulate to it, they wouldn't make it a condition. So that's why we're here. 3, 3 p.m. Steve. 3 p.m., I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Just, just, just a, a point. There, there is, there is restrictions on the members. But yeah. That's not accurate. It's, it's uh, yeah. I, I think it, it's the condition no here, condition 15, which is hours of operation, which is applicable to the members. So the, the members can't run rank up there. They are controlled. There's hours, right. there's hours for the golf, the pool and tennis, the dining area, the dining, uh, the dining, uh, 
dinner area, um, the 19 pole area. So there are, there are, there are. But in terms of events, there are. The events are only for yeah. private work. This, 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 to, to me, this would sound like if there is any problems with it, would be more of an enforcement issue by town people, as opposed to the board <coughs> overturning a decision or affirming a decision or what. It, it's an enforcement issue, a lot of it. Well, the bodies prefer not to have an enforcement uh, issue because they then are the ones that have to make the complaints to the building inspector and pursue it. What we had hoped was the building would be modified and slightly pushed back, and then the outdoor deck would not have had an impact in that. Unfortunately, it was not a condition the applicant was willing to uh, uh, agree to. What it's all about, Mr. Chairman, the other ones that wants the building pushed away back. That's what it's all about. And because of that, you know, we cannot do that. We look at that. We're not going to do that. We don't have to do it. And uh, with all due respect. So, we've already pushed it back. We need the zoning setback. That's all I need. I just wanted to clarify that. I certainly have one concern. I have a couple, but one concern, major concern, is. Um, the only time we knew that, that that section was in uh, 4610 was when we got this. Um, so how many more site plan reviews down the line are we going to get challenged with? Um, well, we're not in the business of site plan review, number one. Uh, in terms of doing the power test, it almost appears that uh, this sh this maybe should go back and start from scratch and start with the staff on the power test to find out if there is justification to come back under section six. Oh, I, I, I didn't. I didn't. That's what's in the courts. I think I missed. I think I may have misspoke on that. The building commissioner had agreed with with the determination that this was not an expansion of a non-conforming use. You said so, that. That's, so, that's what I'm saying. If if indeed, if indeed, I didn't see that in the decision. But I mean, that, that I don't know that 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 I think probably appeared just in the form of Glenn having reviewed my letter, talked about it with staff, and, and effectively just ruled administratively that it was not an expansion of a non use. So that, that, that determination was was made, was effectively made, but it's not part of the, there was no written decision. Oh. He, he doesn't issue a written decision of that. Okay. Well, that's my, my big, I, I, just, I don't know how, it, in essence, I'm not sure that we have jurisdiction here, even under that, that section, because we, we're not very clear on exactly what we're doing we're not in we're not empowered the special permit granting authority is cpdc and the only reason that i believe that section is in there is because there's no um appeal process where it can go back to um, that's why most of the special permit granting specifications or, or jur jurisdiction has always been gi given to the uh, Board of Appeals, and then it goes from there. Uh, but I certainly, as, as a member of the board, I don't want to be in the um, um, position of doing site plan review on these things that come up. Uh, I understand that that is a recommendation. I don't know. This, it seems to be which came first. Uh, again, we get into this whole situation. And it always involves <laughs> us and CPDC. Why is it always that, that? If I if I could just add a comment, Please. that's that's that was the reason I was asking the questions earlier this evening about trying to identify the specific grounds, the specific things that the they think are wrong with the CPDC's decision. I mean, so I don't I don't think. The, the problem with this, that section of the zoning bylaw is it doesn't say specifically what you look at and what you don't look at and what site planning you do and what site planning you don't. But the way I would suggest we apply that bylaw is that the board not engage in a full-fledged rehearing of every aspect of site plan approval. I don't think you ought to look at, you know, turning radiuses and, you know, the, the striping of the parking spaces and, and things like that. But if the appellant alleges that there's a legal error or something specifically wrong with the decision, then they have an appeal to you and we, 
sad to say, you, well, what, I think what we kind of have to decide it. So I think that, that was why I was attempting to uh, isolate the specific grounds for the appeal to limit the things that the board would then look at and decide. That was just my my thought on the approach. But Mr. Chairman, this would have been a lot simpler if the building inspector had issued a decision because I've never seen a decision of the building inspector, and I don't think that should be an off the cuff comment that you might get, for example, on DPW or engineering. If we had that decision, we would have appealed that decision to you, and then you could have looked at that one issue and not got drawn into this process. But uh, we we never saw a decision of the building inspector. Mr. Chairman, the procedure would be if they're not happy with it, they appeal the building. That's right. Okay, that's, that's what I would say. That's if he, if he that's saw an issue, then he would so have issued his decision. Say, yeah, this, this fine he didn't see an issue. There's a legal procedure for that. I think that's right. The building commissioner, when reviewing, when ultimately down the road reviewing a building permit application, has to make any number of determinations as to whether the application complies with zoning, building code, and all the other things that they have to look at. They don't issue a decision to the world saying, here's what I found. They issue a building permit, or they deny the building permit, and that's everybody has their rights from that point forward. So I think that's that's fair. A building commissioner would not, if the building commissioner looked at a, a set of plans that this is not an expansion of a non-conforming use, he wouldn't ordinarily issue a decision right. or tell anybody about it. He would just issue the building permit. And then if people don't like the building permit, they can appeal the building permit. He they went see. to CPDC for site plan approval, yeah. and once they had that, and walked down to the building commissioner's office and applied for a building permit. Okay, that would have been issued based upon the site plan review. I don't no. believe so. No, because it's under appeal. Yeah. Here, and so then what, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know, Mr. Chairman. That's the it's <laughs> <laughs> honest answer to the question. It, 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 this is so <laughs> convoluted that. It's your bylaw, though. <laughs> no, it's not my bylaw. And it's not the board's bylaw. We were never consulted. If, if, and I don't want to make any decisions on behalf of the board, but if the board were to side against the appellant, affirm the CPDC decision, and effectively rule in favor of Meadowbrook, I would suggest a brief, relatively brief decision reciting all of that. I mean, you have Basically to make a decision, you have to make a decision yeah. on the appeal. Right. Uh, the, the appellant is entitled to that one way or the other. Um, that decision has to be has to be in writing. It has to Absolutely. be filed with the town clerk. So, hearing, so, it has to so depending upon which way you're going, I don't know that we need to take a whole lot more evidence from the for, from where I'm sitting. Mm. I don't know that we need a whole lot of more evidence as part of the public hearing, but you probably do need to instruct, I would say, somebody to draft a to fold all everything we've heard tonight into a decision for your review and you know produce a written decision that's responsive to what they've what they've argued and we can we can Andrew can do that we can do that we can work together to try to come up with something even though we've never really worked under this section of the bylaw before if we were about to do that I haven't even opened up the public section but nobody wanted to be sworn in so I assume that we don't have a public input from it but um, I think that the appropriate individual writing that would be yourself, because you are most familiar with both sides of the coin and able to put us in a situation where, by reviewing that uh, post decision, uh, would give us uh, grounds and give the appellant grounds to move forward. Yep. Whether it's going to be in Superior Court or where it's ever going to be. But, um, I mean, I, I can't. I can't see any other other option that we have. Yeah. I know you haven't spoken yet, Mr. Bernard. Go ahead, <laughs> speak. May, may I? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Nick Bonanno. I live at 283 Grove Street. <coughs> I appreciate a few minutes. Um, with all due respect uh, to uh, Attorney Heap, he, he did base his decision solely on input from Meadowbrook or whatever the staff had at the time. Is that that decision came out May 8th that opinion letter and the application wasn't filed until the end of June then the hearing started so I had no direct input to attorney Heap in his, in his consideration of issuing an opinion and so the information and I never saw the letter even though I asked for it when we became aware an opinion was issued I requested it several times back in I think the end of May 
and I was repeatedly told I'm not entitled to see it. So I have no idea what Attorney Heap's opinion was actually, how he formed his opinion or what he, whatever. I didn't see that letter. I finally got it nine days ago. And then reconstructing that, um, the input from uh, Attorney McGrail uh, to Attorney Heap and looking at the emails back and forth. I can see there's a number of, of misinformation, whether uh, done in error or for whatever reason. But obviously, the input from Meadowbrook was the basis for the opinion. There was no corroboration of that of that um, information. There was no vetting of that information. It would have been very easy to vet it. I put, and during the hearing process, I pointed that pointed out errors, and it was dismissed. So I can go through a lot of the, a lot of those errors tonight, or uh, most of them are in the outline, not all of them, but most of them are in that outline that, that attorney uh, Chick Kelly gave you. But um, uh, when somebody represents, there's going to be no change, and then they present information that's totally different than what's going on today. There's no way that attorney Heap would know that there's a problem, that there's a disconnect, and the staff would uh, wouldn't know it. It's a private club. Nothing's posted. Now, and, and uh, to be fully transparent, I was a member at Meadowbrook for, I think, over 35 years. I served on the board. I'm, I'm very familiar with the club and how it operates. And I have nothing against the club. I mean, I think it's a great asset to the community. I think it's, a, it's really a testament to all the members that have been there over the decades that it's still a successful operating club. I have no... Uh, no problem with a new clubhouse being built. I have a problem when the, the plan is to push activity outdoors when it's always been indoors. And one example, we talk about uh, say private events or member events or member-sponsored events. Uh, even in the re response to um, Attorney Heap from Attorney McGrail, in, w in one response he says, oh, the, uh, those events are gonna end outdoors like they currently do at 9 p.m. And then he says, there are no outdoor events, they're all indoors. And that's true. They don't use the existing deck for events. It's too small. So, you know, at the, the hours of operation, um, for decades, it's dinner two nights a week. That's in the license. You go back up how many years, it's two nights. And the uh, hours that are submitted, it represents that dinner's going to be five nights a week. And so there's just point after point that it's, you know, it's either misleading or not, not totally uh, uh, correct. And, and um, you know, Attorney Heap has to base an opinion on only what he got from Meadowbrook. And I just want, you know, all the right information to go to whoever's going to make the decision. And whichever way the decision goes, fine, it's based, but at least base it on accurate information as to what's ex existing today, how it's used, and what's really proposed for tomorrow. And the building footprint itself might be about the same, but when you go to uh, 1,800, 1,900 square feet of outdoor space, 80% uh, of it has a roof. I assume it's going to have lights. And when the CPDC talks about, well, what are the hours on Main Street for the b and restaurant? You know, we should do that for Meadowbrook. Because there's like no consideration it's a residential area. So th there's a balance in here. And I just want all the right information to be to the right people. And you can form the, the best opinion you can form. Thank what you. was the first date of the uh, hearing with CPDC? Well, the application, uh, I think was July 9th was the first hearing on this recent application. They had submitted an application, uh, I think, towards the end of July of 2017. There was one hearing in August of 2017, and then Meadowbrook withdrew the, rap with, withdrew the application in October. And then they resubmitted, effectively, almost the same application at the end of June. But we did have one here in June of 18? June of 18. Um, seven or eight weeks after Attorney Heap's uh, opinion letter came out. Uh, and uh, my attorney referenced the, f the feedback that CPTC gave uh, Meadowbrook after the August hearing of 2017. They had issues. 
with you know the location or the or um, the traffic, um, parking. I mean, nobody really understands take you know the, the workforce at Meadowbrook. Everything's grown, which is nice, but they have a full-time and part-time wor uh, workforce of 83 people. Now they're not all there at the same time, but they have more employees, and the parking they don't have the parking capacity, and and it's just parking all over the place. And I know the CPDC wants to clean that up, and they they did that with some of the site plan review, but. Um, even though planning asked several times for uh, some kind of documentation to show that the parking would be sufficient, Meadowbrook didn't, didn't respond. And so there's, there's, a, there's a parking problem. But the activity is going to increase in that clubhouse. If not today, tomorrow, because it's designed to handle uh, small functions simultaneously with serving members. And it's something they really can't do today. That clubhouse is not designed to do that. Well, can't speculate in the future. Sure, if I may just for a little bit. Go ahead. When the clubhouse operates, it's a bit of a anybody else, as the Chair said, thinks there's something going on at that point that constitutes a substantial extension or a change. They can bring in enforcement action anytime they want. That's the remedy, not the discussion here. As I said to begin with, this is this is so irregular in my tenure with the board uh, that you had, in addition to a section of the bylaw without any direction, um, number one, and the question is, how? What is the formula? What is the pro? protocol to push that section of the bylaw forward so how do you know if you can do that and how the board how does it know that you are making an appropriate um, application before the board for relief because we don't know what the relief is and it's certainly not site plan review we're not going to get into uh, that aspect I, I just go back uh, if I I said it before, Mr. Uh, Counselor. Um, it's almost be better off if we start from scratch again and formalizing it with uh, uh, the town building commissioner or building inspector uh, to make a formal and, and let it go through. If, if that's what the, using the power test. And you mentioned if you think that that's an extension uh, or an expansion, and let's let's get it done. I mean, I I don't think that anybody, with the exception, I sh don't take this the wrong way, with the exception of attorneys, want to go back into court time after time after time and get nothing accomplished. And that's basically what you're asking right now. Relief to go back to court. And I know from personal experience, court can take not six months, not years, not six years, but 10 years to, to, to just make a decision that, that would uh, be fair and impartial. And we don't even know who's sitting the, sitting the case as the jurors. But anyways, beside the point, if, if uh, town council uh, feels that he can make a, a draft letter, in my mind, just speaking as one member of the board, in my mind, of what exactly we're doing here right now, um, and give it back to the board for review, I'm willing to continue this to a uh, day forward to get that letter to, re to consider uh, what action to I take. I think you better ask Chris, because I don't think that's exactly what they're looking for tonight. I think they're looking for a decision. And Chris would draft up the decision for us. That's exactly. Period. That's exactly what I'm. That's it. Okay. So we need a decision, and whether to affirm, okay. return, or modify. And okay. I mean, you don't necessarily need to vote the decision tonight because you could, you could, but you at a minimum, I think, need 
what I'd suggest is you need to express some thoughts as to where you think you might go on the application so that somebody can then draft the decision for you. So you can you can vote it tonight if you want, or you can sort of deliberate a little bit enough to give some guidance as to what that decision might look like. Um, you could do either one. Either one's fine. Mm -hmm. um, I, you don't. You're not absolutely required to close the public hearing and vote it tonight, but but you certainly could if you want, and then have a written decision ready to go in a week or two after that. The only comment I would have, John, is I just I, the only thing that goes through my head is why are we sitting here at this point in time? talking about this subject, which I don't understand why it wasn't discussed during the process of preparing and deciding the site plan review. Why didn't all this get discussed there and brought up there? Okay? To me, the site plan review, excuse me, let me finish. The site plan review is done. The decision's been made. Now it's up to the town people, to the offices, to implement that decision. Okay? And I don't, personally don't think this board should be in the business of getting into that process. It's done. As far as I'm concerned, I don't see a reason why we can't vote on the darn thing tonight and yeah. decide. I really don't see any reason why we can't do that. Mr. Chairman, and I, think that's a good, I, no, I think that's a good idea, but I just want the board to understand, I don't want to be here. I'm here because of your, not your, your bylaw. And, and the issue is if we didn't come, we would be faulted. Understand. And, and, I understand. A, and a motion to dismiss would be filed. So we really had to file both, and we apologize for taking your time, but we really, I don't think we had a choice. We had to exhaust local remedies. Yep. We still had to file the other one. So that. I understand, I understand. this is a very unique situation for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. On a board member. I have just one question. Throughout in general, how come if you thought this should have come before the board to begin with and not gone through site plan review? Why wasn't it brought to the board's attention or brought to the board earlier? Why now? Uh, it, it was, it, 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 I, I made that uh, statement several times uh, on the record to the CPDC. Uh, okay. We didn't have a decision to appeal. So in other words, I, I can't just come to this board. Uh, I have been asking for a decision. Uh, I, I couldn't appeal the town council's letter. That's just an opinion to the, the CPDC. So I didn't have anything to appeal. As uh, Attorney McGrail mentioned, there wasn't a building permit, so there was nothing to okay. bring to you, unfortunately. And, and I don't disagree with that. If, 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 if there was an expansion of the nonconforming use, that would have been a permit that Meadowbrook needed. So they would have been the applicant. They would have been the one to file an application right. with, with you in that scenario. Yeah. But yeah. where there was a finding that there was no expansion, there was no application for them to wow. apply for. So there was nobody coming in for relief. And there was really no way for um, the neighbors to get in on that uh, absent issuance and appeal wow. of a building permit. Okay. And, and I think, Mr. Chairman, actually, and, and I stand to be corrected, but I believe that since that decision was done in 95, that your bylaw has been modified, that now, if there's a special permit with site plan review, the CPDC has jurisdiction of both. Um, and I, I don't know if Andrew knows more than that for me, so potentially, even if it, even if it was a fine whom CPDC said it wasn't, I think there's a, there's a possibility that would have been before CPDC and not before you. Exactly. And that's why, and that's why uh, 4610 is in there to offer relief without even giving any thought to what that relief is supposed to be. And that's what my major concern was from the very beginning. Um, you can't have, I'm not going to go any further. I can always admit I don't have enough information to understand what the use is and the change and the reason for the changes and renovations of the building to weigh in on any of the deliberation here. It's not enough presented for me to understand the reason for the change and if that does cause a change in use, but even at that point it's not for us to decide if that's a change in use in this committee. So I'm left being as confused. Okay. I don't have that information. Well, then we have basically two options. We can uh, make a motion to affirm the decision of the CPDC in this case, um, or we can uh, move to uh, overturn the uh, CPTC, CPDC's decision in this particular case on the site plan review. What that would 
begin? I have no idea. So I will take a motion. I would like to hear the motion. Do you need to open for a couple of hearings? Just yes. procedural, open it, and then close it. So. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, <laughs> just not seeing anybody who was interested no, in taking the oath, but just in case, um, I'll open the subject matter to the public hearing, uh, to the public uh, for comment. Seeing none, I will now close it. Good. So I will accept that. I will go ahead and make a motion, John, that uh, the board in the case of uh, number 1902, uh, case number 1902, uh, go ahead and affirm the CPDC, the CPDC decision as written. I want to put it CPDC's decision and site plan review. So CPD decision and site plan review uh, as written. Decision, uh, if you want to get the date on that, I believe we have the copy of it there. I think it was uh, dated uh, November 7, 2018. Site plan review decision. Yeah. So I'll make reference to that and okay. I'll make the motion. For your second? Second. Sorry, seconds. Any other discussion? Hearing none. Um, in favor of that decision, of that motion? Excuse <coughs> me, motion. Raise your hand. 500. Chris? No. I'm going to ask you again um, to put that in perspective for the board. I can do that. Um, Again, I, I think we need some major work done on four four sixteen. I, I, would you take that back to CPDC? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And Thank you, Chairman. Chairman. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, we we can we've we've seen how this works in other towns. We can offer some some su suggestions as to what, yeah. how to. I, I don't care how you, how you do it, but we, we get 14 days to do this. We would like to get it done and get it to the board, board by virtue of the yeah. internet. And if anybody have any questions, we'll try to get it done. It's being written. Thank you. Okay. This one is Done. Well, that's why we have two of them tonight. Yeah. And actually, it was great that you were here and then yeah, just appreciate happened. it. Yeah. 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 Well, I can let it drag on a little bit too long, but I, I, I want to make sure everybody got there. I want to get the interview set. It's a tough one. We're still on the TV now. Yeah. I know. Okay. Okay. Thanks again, Chris. Thank you. Uh, do we have other than some minutes? But I just got the day. Yeah. 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 Can we? I haven't had a Can we? Yes. Yeah. Can we do them next time? Yes. Okay. If that's the case, I don't think we have any other business. Do we? I don't think so. Do we have any other business? Uh, other than. Uh, Did you just need to say that you're going to put on the 
Yeah. Looks pretty much so much. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was going to suggest that when's our next meeting now? Uh, it was scheduled for the 24th, right? Next Thursday, yes. Next Thursday. That's a 40B. Yeah. That's the 40B. Yeah. Yep. So why don't we do that at the very beginning of the meeting then? Get oh, the minutes? the minutes? The minutes. Sure. Up to you. Yeah, up to you. If you want to do that. Sure. Yeah. Then we get it out of the way. We don't have to wait. Yeah, sure. And we don't have to go next time or something. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay. 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 Just note where it Okay. Right then for ah. motion to continue the uh, decision on the minutes until the 24th. <laughs> yeah. Seven. 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 Second. Second. Do we need a vote on that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. We haven't before in the past. Yes. Yes. No. <laughs> 124. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Now we need a motion. Motion to adjourn. So move. Do I have a second? <laughs> second. Third, fourth, and fifth. Okay. <laughs> we are adjourned. Okay.